I am seeing Aladdin at the Princess of Wales Theater. Welcome to Teacup for One. My name is Matt and I have two degrees and that's right friends, today we are back in my favorite city in the entire world, or at least my favorite city in the entire world that doesn't have a Disney theme park. Whoa. Toronto, Ontario, for the most exciting of reasons. If you know me, you know that there are multiple things I love, but top of the list are cats, we're not seeing any cats tonight, but Disney and theater. And if I can see a Disney theater piece, oh, chef's kiss, center of the Venn diagram for happiness. And so tonight I am thrilled because I am going to be seeing the Broadway tour of Aladdin, which is really exciting because I saw Aladdin the last time it was in Toronto during its pre-Broadway run. And that production was fine, but like it was pre-Broadway. It was the run they did to figure out what they had to change before they went to Broadway. It was the production that they have a special feature kind of dedicated to on the Aladdin I think Signature Edition Blu-ray, where they essentially say it wasn't good, but we know why, and we made changes to make it good for Broadway. So this is my first time seeing it since the rewrite. But I got here a little bit early, partially because I heard that there were sports happening tonight, so I didn't want to risk getting caught in traffic. But also, because I wanted to take this opportunity just to do a short video on this entire street. So right now we are on King Street West, kind of right between King and John and King and University. And this is known as the Theatre District, or the Entertainment District, here in Toronto. So this is where you're going to find venues like Roy Thompson Hall, also known as the home of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, the Tiff Bell Lightbox, also known as the home of the Toronto International Film Festival, and this building right behind me, the Royal Alex Theatre. Now this obviously is not where we're going tonight to see Aladdin, but this is where I went last week to see the Toronto production of Six. And also, how exciting is it that Canada got its own production of Six? It's spectacular. See it. Six. But that is just one of the many reasons that this building behind me is so thrilling. Actually, the Royal Alex Theatre is kind of single-handedly the reason that this entire street, that this entire entertainment district is what it is. So the Royal Alex Theatre opened up in 1907, and I believe, at least according to my labor-intensive Wikipedia research, the Royal Alex is the oldest continually running theatre in North America. Like, this has been around since 1906, 19, no, 1907. This theatre has been around since 1907. It has never not been a theatre. There have been periods in its life where maybe it was going under renovations, it didn't have a show in it, but it's never not been a theatre. It was almost not a theater, and ironically, it almost not being a theater is why it has become such a long-lasting theater. In the 1960s, this chunk of land right behind me here, it was actually purchased by businessman Ed Mervish. Now remember that name, both Ed and Mervish. Ed Mervish, at the time in the 60s, he wasn't a theater guy. He owned Honest Ed's, which was a Toronto landmark. There's no place like this place, any place. <laughs> The world-famous bargain house, Honest Ed. It's not with us anymore, but it was just like the ultimate Toronto discount store. Honest Ed, you even attract squirrels. At these prices, they think I'm nuts. And so he bought up this space behind me in like 1962, 1963, because I heard he wanted to be a parking lot. Put up a parking lot. And he bought it for only $250,000. And in 1960 money, if you account for inflation, that's only around $2.5 million by today's standards. And like... To pay that for a theater, a theater that is as beautiful as this one is, like, that's a steal. These prices, they think I'm nuts. But anyway, he didn't care that it was a theater. He valued the land, again, Wikipedia or some unverified source on the internet said he wanted to turn it into a parking lot. Put up a parking lot. But part of the condition of sale was that for him to purchase the Royal Alex Theater, he had to keep it in operation as a theater for at least five years. And he committed to it. Like, his first year of ownership of the theater was spent revitalizing and rejuvenating the space. And for the longest time, it operated as a roadhouse. So it was bringing in tours of American productions and it thrived. And then Ed eventually realized, well, people are going to come here for the theater. They're probably going to want to eat too. So he ended up building restaurants. And if you see this big gaping space in between the Royal Alex Theater and those buildings, there used to be a bunch of warehouses there. Ed bought them. He converted them into Ed's Warehouse, which was a restaurant specifically catering to people who were going to the theater. I brought you here to show you one of Toronto's most talked about restaurants, Ed's Warehouse. I'm all dressed up because it's a very special kind of restaurant. And their thing. Oh, look, it's a car with a TV on it. That's fun. 
Hey, Survivor, that show's still on? So the thing with Ed's Warehouse, I wish Ed's Warehouse was still here. If Ed's Warehouse was still here, I would be having a delicious meal there right now instead of making this video. So it worked out well for you because you get to watch this video. Not so well for me because I don't get reasonably priced prime rib. But yeah, the only thing they served was just like plated prime rib. I think you got to pick if you wanted like a small, medium, or a gigantic piece, but that was it. Prime rib. Between the success of the Royal Alex as a theater venue and Ed's Warehouse as a restaurant full of delicious prime rib, King Street began to evolve into Toronto's entertainment district. By the 1980s, Ed moved into producing and founded Mervish Productions with his son David, and today, Mervish Productions is Canada's largest commercial theater company. So Ed's Warehouse, the prime rib haven, ended up shutting down in 2000. I was lucky because I got to dine there as a really little kid, when I was in grade four. So it was probably right before they closed, like 97, 98, but not because I was seeing anything at the Royal Alex, it was actually because I was going to the theater that we're going to tonight, the Princess of Wales, to see the Canadian production of Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast was only the second show that they had in the Princess of Wales theater. And you know what? We're on our way there now. Let's start to talk about the Princess of Wales. It's the musical so big they had to build a brand new theater, Miss Saigon. So as all my musical theater friends know, the late 80s and the early 90s, that was the era of big budget spectacle musical theater. That was the Cameron Macintosh era. That was when like chandeliers were falling in Phantom of the Opera. That was when helicopters were flying in Miss Saigon. And funny we should mention Miss Saigon, the Princess of Wales was purpose built to house Miss Saigon because as beautiful and historic as the Royal Alex is there behind me, there's no way a helicopter was going to fly on the Royal Alex stage. So they had to build a theater that could house like the types of shows that were being done, hence the Princess of Wales. So it opened up I think in 1991 with the Canadian production of Miss Saigon. After that closed, the next sit down production was Beauty and the Beast, which was probably my first exposure to proper musical theater that like wasn't in a theme park and wasn't on ice and it was life-changing. Toronto's a really important theater town, more so than ever now, and uh, to have this opening is a thrill. And since then, this theater has housed so many incredible productions, some of them fully Canadian casts, some of them tours, and what's really thrilling, a little bit more history, this is the same space where we had the original Canadian production of The Lion King, and The Lion King is coming back to Toronto with its own sit-down production with an all-Canadian cast later this year, opening in the fall. I actually submitted a self-tape to try to get an audition for the role of Scar. He's the son, can you play me a memory? I'm not really sure how it goes. I still haven't heard back, so uh, let's make hashtag Matt for Scar start trending, shall we? <laughs> Another really cool production I saw here at the Princess of Wales was the world premiere, not the Canadian premiere, the world premiere of the infamous Lord of the Rings musical. I was in the first ever preview audience. I was in the first house of people to sit and watch that show. <laughs> the preview started at 7.30 at night. I got out at one o'clock in the morning. My dad spent nearly six hours that evening just parked right there waiting for the show to let out. But it was like next to a hot dog stand, which, fun fact, is my favorite hot dog stand in the city of Toronto. Is I got a hot dog right now? Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Matt Reviews Toronto Foods. Today we are having a spicy Italian sausage from this hot dog stand right at King & John. The best hot dog stand in all of Toronto, if not the world. And I'm not just blowing smoke. Like, I've had hot dogs in New York City and other places in Toronto. None of them compare to this place. So here we go. Let's give it a try. It's perfect. If you like sausages, and if you just like genuinely good food at a good price point, across from one of the ritziest theaters in all of Toronto, if not Canada, if not the world, you will like this. Hey, look, this mailbox is commemorating legendary Canadian Leonard Cohen, and also graffiti. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We actually still have a little bit of time before the doors open up, so something kind of cool that I want to show you is just around here, around the corner of the Princess of Wales, you're going to notice this building I'm walking next to is painted totally white. When uh, the Ed's Warehouse Prime Rib Emporium, I added Prime Rib Emporium, but that's what it was, when that was still in operation, it was also in a warehouse painted totally white. Like, I gather that the aesthetic of King Street when it was under Mervish's 
control, for lack of a better term, was just like beautifully painted white buildings. And you'll see right behind me here at the Mervish parking lot, we have that beautifully illuminated arrow that says Mervish parking. All of the storefronts for like the Ed's Warehouse and the other restaurants and the theaters, they seemingly all had that aesthetic, but the only remnant left of it is that parking structure. But fun fact, Mervish parking is evidently $22 to see the show. There are cheaper parking lots in this area. I'm not going to tell you where they are right now. Like, I don't want broadcast because they're my secret. But if you really want to know, message me on Instagram. I'll tell you. Ooh, and also, I just had a flashback. You're going to notice, see these, uh, this underground storefront area here? Right now, it is the King Fresh Food Market. When I was in high school, it was this awesome store called Theater Cues. It was just this amazing place to buy all things theater. They had CDs and original cast recordings from, like, the most obscure, as well as the most up-to-date Broadway musicals. I went there. I got a CD of Starmite. We're the Starmites. The mighty Starmites. We fight for the ride and tonight to be free. Nobody knows why what Star Mites is, but it's a very near and dear show to my heart, and they had the CD, and that was a big deal for me. But anyway, now it's a supermarket. Wow, this is just on the ground. That's sad. Okay, we're in the Princess of Wales Theater. They just opened up the doors, but first I have to show you, like, the hidden gem of this theater that a lot of people overlook. It's right here. Whoa, it's this. This is a note we'll read together from Kensington Palace. Dear Ed, I wanted to write personally to wish you a very happy 83rd birthday. I was delighted to hear that the new Princess of Wales Theatre was completed in 1993. I understand you have enjoyed a very successful run of Miss Saigon and are currently playing the marvelous Beauty and the Beast. I hope you have a wonderful birthday party and send my sincerest congratulations on this special day and wish you continued success and happiness for many years to come. With love from... Diana. Yes, that Diana, Princess of Wales. Now, I don't know if that's actually her signature, but I'd like to think she wrote that note. The Princess of Wales Theatre was named to honor Princess Diana with her blessing. Unfortunately, she never had the chance to visit the theatre in person. However, she did attend a performance of Les Mis at the Royal Alex Theatre in 1991. One of the many cool features of the Princess of Wales Theatre are these murals, which you're going to find scattered throughout the lobbies and in the actual theatre space. They were commissioned by abstract artist Frank Stella when the theatre was first being built, and reportedly, they cover like 10,000 square feet. Wikipedia says it might be one of the largest mural installations in modern times, but I didn't verify that. Also seems kind of niche, but fun fact. So we are in the balcony tonight, the very, very tip top of the theater. And I could take the elevator, but I have like 45 minutes, so why not? And also we're treated to all these delightful posters telling us what's coming next, as well as this impressively, if not kind of overwhelmingly tall banner charting the entire theatrical history of this theater. Actually, you know what? We have the time. Let's walk the banner. Let's go back in time. I'm going to tell you which of these shows I saw, which I didn't see. Okay, we've made it to the ground floor, the bottom. Here we go, 25 years. The King and I, 2018. Actually, a friend of mine offered me a ticket to see that to accompany his mom, but I was busy that day, so I didn't get to go. Going up, Cabaret, 2017. I saw that. It was one of the greatest productions I've seen in my life. We're venturing up there now to the balcony. I did not realize Strictly Ballroom was a stage show. There's a Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer musical. Okay. War Horse. The funny thing about when War Horse was in this theater is that I saw it very emotional because it was around 2012. I was convinced it was the last thing I was ever going to see in this space. In 2012, around the same time War Horse was playing, Ed's son David Mervish announced that the Princess of Wales Theater was going to be torn down and replaced with condos. The Princess of Wales days may be numbered. When I need another theater, I'll put another one in. But the condos were going to be designed by Frank Gehry, so apparently that was supposed to make it okay. Anyway, that ended up not happening. I'm not asking questions, I'm just happy the theater's still here. Moving on. Hugh Jackman live in concert. I did see that, and I actually shook Hugh Jackman's hand at the stage door. It was this hand. They had High School Musical here? The theater built for and named in honor of Princess Diana, which saw the Canadian premiere <laughs> of Miss Saigon, was also home to a production of High School Musical. Hairspray, I saw that, that was great. Lion King, a classic. Remember, hashtag Matt for Scar. When I wore a younger man's clothes, 
Meow, 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 cats. Cats, 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 cats. Oh, we made it. We're at the top floor. Oh, we made it to 1993. Behold, 1993, Miss Saigon. But we don't care about that. Beauty and the Beast. Such a good production. And also, look how high we are. Okay, this is what you came here for. Let's talk about the show. Oh, but also what you're seeing is promo footage. People you're seeing on screen are probably not the cast I saw. That said, Act 1, without question, the standout of this production is Marcus M. Martin as the genie. The show honestly needs more genie. I was a little disappointed on the staging for One Jump Ahead, but I'm also aware that the number can't be as physically high energy as it is in the film while expecting people to sing. I love Jasmine's new song, These Palace Walls, and how it ties into her scene meeting Aladdin. That was just beautiful. Speaking of beautiful, the Cave of Wonder scenes and the Friend Like Me production number, that delivered a level of spectacle that made me giddy. It was perfect. No notes. Intermission. We're at intermission. I want to see if I can find an ice cream sandwich. Or if not an ice cream sandwich, ice cream on a stick. So the show is sold out tonight, so the lobbies on all levels are a little bit chaotic. I did it, I got my Hagen dogs. Well, one of my favorite memories from this theater is when I was here for that first ever preview of Lord of the Rings the musical. The director told us beforehand that they were gonna be stopping and starting. That was gonna be kind of chaotic at night, and it was. And to compensate for that, they offered open bar all night. And Lord of the Rings musical had two intermissions. So both intermissions, it was like the Hunger Games, trying to get to the bar. And I had just turned 19, which is the drinking age, here at least in Ontario, so I could have had alcohol for free. I didn't. I just wanted, like, a package of chocolate-covered almonds. I almost lost an arm. Anyway, time for Act 2. Act 2! There are two big standout numbers in Act 2. Prince Ali and A Whole New World. This might be controversial, but I don't love how Prince Ali has been rearranged musically and how it's been staged for this adaptation. Full disclosure, I'm a Disney Renaissance kid. Between Disney World, Disney on Ice, and a Fever Dream Mall tour, I grew up seeing Aladdin numbers staged in person like a fair bit, and this might be my least favorite live take on Prince Ali. It's a great showcase number for the genie, and again, we love the genie. Give us all the genie. But Prince Ali in this production is more of a Cab Calloway style jazz number that's been really slowed down and, I don't know, it's missing the spectacle that I want from Prince Ali, especially as an Act 1 opener. With that said, the magic carpet effect in A Whole New World is gorgeous. That did not disappoint. The staging for this song is both simple and magical, and the song was sung beautifully. All in all, I don't think Aladdin is Disney's strongest stage adaptation, but it's still a show that delivers on fun and magic, and this cast is really solid. There's a violin player. Violin? Yeah. There's a musician playing over the rainbow. Oh, he's so good. And just like that, Aladdin is done. Now, I thought about going to the stage door. It's right there behind me, if that's of any interest. But, like, there's literally no one there. If this was a New York City situation where there were, like, at least 10 to 50 people, I might have stayed in the crowd, cheered a little bit. Asked him to sign my program, but I felt really weird. Like, I know I'm teacup for one, I'm all about doing things solo, but not that. So, if any of the cast from the Tour of Aladdin end up watching this, just know I wanted your autograph, but I was too socially anxious to do it by myself. So, anyway, friends, that concludes this episode of Teacup for One. Thank you so much for joining me on tonight's adventure to see Aladdin. I hope you enjoyed coming on this adventure with me, even though you didn't get to actually watch. <laughs> The show and i hope you enjoyed learning a little bit of toronto's history specifically the history that gave us toronto's entertainment district as i said this is one of my favorite cities and i hope the next time i bring you along to the princess of wales it's when i'm playing scar and the lion king sing us a song tonight again it's probably not going to happen because they still haven't returned my calls but all the more reason to get hashtag matt for scar trending on twitter x instagram I don't know. Either way, Matt, two degrees, teacup for one, teacup out.